Okay, welcome back everyone. We're here live in Las Vegas. This is Silicon Angles, the Cube live coverage, exclusive coverage of IBM Pulse, IBM's premier cloud conference. This is the Cube. We extract a signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Angle. I'm joined by co-host Dave Vellante, co-founder of Wikibon.org. Our next guest is Doug Baylog, GM of Power Systems, uh, Systems and Technology Group. Uh, welcome to the Cube. Thank you, appreciate being here. So uh, we had Steve Mills on earlier, we're talking about the, the perspective. You've mm -hmm. been a 30 year vet at IBM. You've seen many movies being played, transformations. Um, IBM has maintained their DNA over those, all those transformations. First, first question is, how does this rank uh, relative to inflection points within yeah. IBM? You get the cloud, you get the big data, everything's happening on premise in the cloud, full disruption. Yeah. A lot of opportunities. Yeah, as a 30-year veteran, I mean, this is, uh, I have to admit, sort of one of the most uh, profound set of changes occurring at a single point in time that I've seen in my 30 years. And we've gone through plenty of almost sort of single cycle changes, obviously some economics ups and downs, but, uh, but this is pretty profound what's happening, right? As you said, the whole role around big data and how clients are just drowning in data, looking for solutions to that, trying to get business insights from their data. The role of mobile feeding that data, creating that data, the social aspect of how that plays in, and then the on-premise, off-premise, -prem and aspect of hybrid cloud. I mean, it's just moving at lightning speed right now. So and, you, and the winners will be those who respond to it, right, at lightning speed. So you've, you've been in the, managed a lot of the business from the mainframe, Unix, and then you know, now power systems. Um, computing's changing, you got you know, potentially infinite available compute in the, in the cloud, you got virtualization, you got a lot of disruption and, and uh, innovation even on-prem in the data center, software, kind of at the, at the center of the value proposition. Um, so, so what is the state of the systems these days? As, as people are designing the hardware yeah. and the systems, you got virtualization, you got software on a chip, new compilers, what all this tech. Mm -hmm. Tell us what's, what's your vision there and how you see that playing out. Yeah, so, so a couple aspects about the systems. We still see there's a strong client need for highly innovative systems to solve real purpose-built issues, right? The issue around data and the different types of data are not one that can be addressed by simply taking commodities off the shelf and, and strapping them together. It really takes good innovation, good systems design, I believe certainly in the power business, a strong processor design even focused on big data, and then how you build the system around it. So then the other thing is openness. I mean, I think it's foolish for anybody to think one company can figure it all out. So if that's from a system design standpoint, why it's so critical in my view, not only to do a lot of the great design yourself, but then open it up to a set of ecosystem partners that can sort of add on extra value and take it up a whole nother level. What's your experience with the ecosystem? I mean, obviously some ecosystem formulas are, are different, but now you mentioned that the entire landscape from channel partners to developers is different now. It's more open, it's more yeah. dynamic, it's more transparent. You know, we talked about democratization within he earlier. You know, democratization, yeah. people are being liberated with software and, and big data. So is it, this, is it a new formula? How, what's your approach? How are you going to win the ecosystem? Yeah, so, so the, you know, in, in the past, we would have kind of approached the ecosystem almost one vendor at a time saying, hey, would you come work on power, right? One at a time, you threw it, do it through economic models, maybe it's investments of people and capital up front, maybe it's investments at the back end. That just doesn't scale though in the end. So you've got to find a new way to attract the ecosystem. Obviously, the approach we're taking is this open approach. So we're attracting the open ecosystem in our view through a couple of things. First off is open power. We fundamentally believe open power changes the game for the power architecture. It creates a consortium based approach. Some describe it as an arm-like model for the data center that says, you know what, anybody can have access with intellectual property to the power processor. They can do derivatives off it to add value to it. In fact, at the end of the day, and it says surprise some, we'll even let eventually clients or, or users take it and fab it at their own fabs. So it, it creates a whole new access point for technology. We were never going to sell power servers from IBM to some of the large internet data centers. They've got a model yeah. that says they're going to build it themselves. We're seeing that validation. We just covered the Open Compute Summit in San Jose, and, and uh, Dave and I were joking because I was just at the Apple 30th anniversary yeah. of the of the Mac, and you know, seeing all the old timers there talking about, you know, I had 6K to work with, and I had to take it from the Finder right. from Mac Paint. 
but you know, it was kind of like the, the analogy was you're seeing kind of a homebrew, mm -hmm. you know, tinkerer engineering culture coming back right. as developers in hardware yep. for things like this to innovate. So you're seeing that trend back. Yeah. Is that kind of, does that tie into that? It, it, it absolutely does. I mean, from an ecosystem, we're not just stopping though at the hardware layer in terms of innovators. Certainly, we love the fact that a company like Mellanox is a part of Open Power and bringing I.O. innovation. We love the fact that NVIDIA is bringing uh, GPU accelerators to the party. Mm -hmm. We love the fact that some of the ODMs like Tyan and others are bringing that innovation. But at the same time, I want to continue to extend up the stack into the software layers and even the end users, right? So that we get more of the likes of Google participating in Open Power. It's a big opportunity. So talk a more, more, little bit more about o Open Power and in, in the initiative. You mentioned Mellanox. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you're, essentially you're saying you're opening up the IP. Right. People can build derivative products. Uh, who other than Mellanox is sort of involved? Yeah, so as I said, uh, David, you know, we, uh, the first five founding members, and this started back in August of last year, we announced together, the five of us, that was uh, IBM, Google, Mellanox, uh, and Tyann, and NVIDIA, announced sort of this intent to form Open Power. So that was sort of the five folks who came together, saw a common need in the market for openness around servers. Obviously, each of those brought a different perspective from the server ecosystem, and they got together, and by December, we actually announced the official formation of the company. Since then, we've sort of thrown the gates open and said, anybody can join. We now have 12 members. Recently, we added Samsung uh, two weeks ago, and we announced that out at IBM Partner World. Samsung, very interested from a memory perspective of bringing sort of their memory innovation to be part of the Open Power Foundation. We have 70 other companies now that are sort of working through the process of filling out the paperwork, applying to be part of it, and becoming part of the Open Power Foundation. So uh, it's a rich looking ecosystem right now. So where are, um, are, is IBM applying power? I, mean, I think we understand that pretty well, but I'd love to understand that more. And where do you see the ecosystem applying power? I think in use cases, yeah. uh, workloads, applications. Yeah, so Open Power, uh, you know, there, we have had other uh, power-based uh, ecosystems in the past. They've been fo focused at times on the embedded space. They've been focused in the past on the PC space. Open Power is focused on the server space, right? So we're not uh, being distracted by other. You know, we're not trying to be mobile, right? We're not trying to put a power in your pocket, right? This is about for solving problems for the data center. So around the ecosystem, how I see it is, because I get asked this question all the time, so what's the end goal look like, right? How do you make this successful? There, there's three ways in which we, we capture value from this, right? One is we sell our intellectual property, just like an ARM-like model, for those who want to take it and, and use it within their market. A great example of that is a couple weeks back, we announced Suzo Power Core in China. China very interested in moving as a country from a manufacturing country to a one building their own uh, domestic IT infrastructure, mm -hmm. right? Very excited it looks like in terms of having power be part of that domestic IT agenda. So that's a license model. That's a license yeah. model around the processor and you know what they do with it, obviously that's up to them and you know, I can't disclose all that, but mm -hmm. very excited about taking that and creating derivative rights around it, right? That's a processor piece around intellectual property licensing. The other is, uh, as I said, we'll sell power eight chips in the future to companies who want to buy motherboards from Tyann, who's a motherboard company, put power eight chips on, maybe do some, something different with the server, and deploy it within their internet data center. So again, that's a chip sell then from IBM, right? And then the third really is the amount of innovation these partnerships are driving. As we look at some of the innovative features coming to market here later this year around power eight, the ability for these companies to innovate you know, in the, for the market, but then I get to capture that innovation and bring it in IBM servers, allows me to bring phenomenal innovation to my clients. So, in particular, number two is, so, uh, if you go back 10 years, you look at yeah. the big giant internet data centers, you know, the, the co common wisdom was, oh, they're just going to layer software on top of commodity right. hardware, and right. that's it, game over. Right. What's actually happened is is the, the a whole the flip, 180 flip, right? Yeah. They're highly customized, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you look at OCP, as John said, we were there a couple weeks ago, you talk to Amazon, they say, well, OCP, not enough customization right. for us, right. right? So, of course, you come from the, the world of, of, of customization. So, yeah. first of all, did, did that did surprise you at all? Is it something that you, you expected? Yeah. And how does, uh, particularly number two, sort of power, Right. eight chips yeah. going into the ecosystem play into that world of high customization. Yeah, one of the things we've found through engaging with a lot of these internet data centers, as you said, is they're each doing innovative things, but they're all slightly different. Mm -hmm. That layer of software clearly exists, but how that layer works with the underlying infrastructure as well as the middleware and applications on top varies uh, dramatically between each of those companies. So they all have a strong point of view and they all think they're right, by the way. 
and for yeah, their, yeah, right. yeah, and, and, they, for, and they are, and they are for their <laughs> business, right? So to think we were going to go in with sort of vanilla for everybody wasn't going to happen. That's where sort of those three different uh, aspects that I laid out, everything from doing derivative rights around processors for those who want high customization, to selling chips for, uh, for end users to build motherboards that are unique for their environment, to IBM capturing that innovation, me selling servers, allows me to address a whole set of clients I was never going to get to before. Mm -hmm. It really, as Ginny likes to say, it's about a new era, trying to get to new buyers. That's really what I'm going after, new buyers here. It, it is, as the general manager, it changes your, your mental model a little oh, bit, yeah. right? You're talking to a bank one day, or somebody in HPC, or somebody wants mm -hmm. to apply Watson as an end customer and bringing in services, and the other end, mm -hmm. you're talking ecosystem. How, yeah. how does Doug split his arms, legs, toes? You yeah. know? Talk about that a little bit. Yeah. But a lot of that does come together, though. As we're seeing it, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the cloud deployments are looking for ways to do you know, rapid pace innovation in the cloud, but they're also trying to connect the core business systems at a client's uh, own infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So the sort of whole notion of a dynamic cloud, hybrid cloud, I see it really playing out, and certainly in the power business. You know, my existing on-premise clients today, they're not looking to throw their infrastructure out. They're looking at how do they extend it, get access to the cloud development you know, set of population out there, how do they mobile enablement? How do they create that next level of web-based, perhaps, engagement models? Uh, and in, I think that sort of notion of hybrid, power in the core running its traditional workloads, power in the front end running some of those systems of engagement at a whole different economic model, is really where we're going to see this thing play out. So let's line up the horses on the track. I mean, Z differentiates itself, right? I mean, it's a different animal. You used right. to run that business, you know it well. Um, so thinking about, obviously, you got x86, mm -hmm. you got, we got power, we got we got Spark, you know, hanging around. I've heard that. Getting, I've heard about that. injection yeah. of capital from you know yeah. Japanese government. Okay, so Mills predicted it was dead, but the you know Japanese government changed that a little bit. But so you got the 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 horses there. Yeah. The big players. What's the differentiation in, yeah. in power? I wonder if you could talk about that. Yeah, one of the things we see, um, you know, in terms of how to how does power differentiate in the market, and, and it's a great question. And and the good news is, is we look at the history of power, which is. Power was really born, uh, born to do data from the day it arrived, right? Mm -hmm. But that was sort of the data we knew of, you know, 20 some years ago. Very much, you know, structured, relational database based deployment. Now if you look at the different types of data coming to market, no SQL, key value stores, right? Hadoop based deployments, all the rest of them, they're all different types of data. But once again, the value prop of power for data centric applications remains really key. And so as part of the strategy for power of changing the dialogue from speeds and feeds to really addressing clients' data problems on-premise and off-premise, this data-centric role is where I'm targeting the power platform. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to get too distracted. I'm not trying to be all things Intel tries to be. I'm really focused on that rich set of data-centric applications. Now, um, given open power, you've got to be a lot open, more open about sort of the roadmap. Can you talk a little bit about you know, Power 8, the roadmap, what, what observers should expect? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, what we've talked about publicly already, so publicly available knowledge, uh, we recently, a couple months back, did a disclosure of the Power 8 processor at the Hot Chips Conference. And what we said there from a the timeline is, you know, very exciting technology, clearly I think uh, we've seen some great articles on that. Uh, but at the same time, from a timeline, we've said, you know, clients should start to expect uh, Power 8 in the middle of this year. Right, so that's when the first systems of Power8 will come to the market. We'll be bringing Power8 for what I call scale-out deployments, one and two socket systems first, followed later in the year by the scale-up platforms that are four sockets and above. Okay, what else should we know about Power8? Well, I think uh, you know, it was really designed for big data from the way in which the processor was designed. So again, if you sort of break down the big data needs, it starts with running the calculations. You need lots of processors, lots of cores, lots of threads. Exploiting that. Yeah, I mean, you got to have you got to have the bandwidth of the process of the compute to run the calculations, right? Run the equation. At the same time, big data needs lots of memory. And so as we look at the memory footprint for Power8, it's a pretty phenomenal improvement from where we've been as well as versus the marketplace today. And then the same is on IO. You know, data is never sort of always at rest. Data is in motion. And so you need a, an IO bandwidth, you need that ability to move data in and out of that working set in memory so that you're dealing with this sort of live flow of data. And then you still need that redundancy, that security, because nobody wants to be the one who has to send the letter saying, sorry, I lost your data. So, and Power's really been designed around those principles. So two other questions, and I'll flip it over to John. So, so Power in cloud, you got some mm -hmm. announcements yep. with SoftLayer, talk That's about right. that, and the other is, What's the play in integrated systems? So start with cloud. Yeah, so start with cloud. So uh, just, uh, just today, uh, we announced here at Pulse that uh, we were moving power into the software cloud. 
Uh, we are starting with Watson, as uh, IBM announced the Watson group here uh, about a month ago. One of the key plays was moving Watson to the cloud. And so as part of the move of Watson to the cloud, since Watson runs on power, that's how it delivers its cognitive capability. It just made perfect sense, of course, then to move Watson on power to the software cloud. That'll be the first deployment in 2Q this year, next quarter. And that'll then sort of scale out to as we move Bluemix, which we've talked about here as well, some of the DB2, DB2 Blue capability, Cognos capability, those set of uh, middleware services. Once again, this great value running that data-centric applications on power in the software cloud. And eventually, we'll get to later this year, bare metal virtualization. And, and, and okay, so that means a, a swipe the credit card self-service type of model to get access to, to J, power, it, or is it a workload sort of paradigm that I'm looking so at? So in or? the first couple, it'll be more workload centric. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, clients will see, obviously with Watson, uh, they may not even know it's running on power right. because you're requiring Watson right. as a service, right? Awesome. Same thing when you get to the API, you know, marketplace model with uh, information management products. Once again, better economic answer of choosing those to run on power in the software cloud, followed by bare metal which obviously is what it is, it's bare metal. And now what about the play in integrated systems? Yeah, so integrated systems uh, around uh, pure, uh, pure flex, pure scale. Obviously, listen, I've got clients who buy you know, pure flex uh, today with an all power deployment. I just brought the market in, I think it was uh, third quarter last year, a whole new set of Power 7 Plus uh, ITEs for that. So integrated systems remains important to me. It's clearly a market need. Clients are looking for that speed of deployment of infrastructure and the ability to uh, acquire in a simple purchasing model, switching, networking with the switching, compute, storage, all well managed. That's an important market, and we're going to continue to serve that market. So I was going to, I was going to ask about the soft layer announcements, but you drilled into it, but I would like to drill down on Watson, because yeah. obviously Watson, we are big fans of. It yeah. humanizes the big data piece. Talk about the Watson discovery. What is Watson evolving into with your group, and, and how does that fit into the cloud? Just do a little deeper dive on that. Yeah, and, and in all fairness, John, I am not the Watson expert, so, uh, you know, but, but if you look at what Watson does from a cognitive era, and you've, you know, we've seen this sort of evolve over the last couple years, right? It really is about deep query analytics, you know, translate it into, yeah. that's lots of really complicated algorithms to, as you build up the data set and the knowledge, and you have to teach Watson, right? At the same time, it's about natural language at the same too, to be able to interact in a human-like style based on, based on speech. Again, the engine of innovation underneath that, from the time it started in research to the step we saw it in, um, in Jeopardy, to now where we see it today, it's continuing to leverage the power technology roadmap. So we've seen that evolve from Power 7 to Power 7 Plus, and now as soon as we get into the software to Power 8. So talk about the cognitive piece, because one of the things Dave and I always, we love talking about some of the new big data stuff, especially when it starts to get into machine learning, yeah. you know, reasoning, learning machines, all that great stuff. Yeah. Cognitive uh, computing. Right, right. Right in your wheelhouse, right? Yeah. So, so that's the pressure with mobile first, right. is there's a lot of cognitive overload. Right. You got to simplify. It's really hard not to crack, and some people can't do it. Yeah. So, so how does that trend? Does that help you? Is that trend your friend? Is that going to help you guys? It's absolutely my friend. In fact, we have a, uh, I think, a great demo here at Pulse that uh, that one can go see. And it takes uh, an application from a company called MD Byline, which is about sort of the way in which one acquires medical uh, necessary devices. But at the same time, because it's Watson, running on Watson on power, while you're sort of going through that purchasing sequence, looking for what you think might solve your uh, health needs, you can then also ask Watson questions. Let's face it, I mean, I am not a medical expert, and so trying to figure out you know, this medical language and how I understand it as a person, it's a great intersect from a human level as well as from uh, providing the right economics for purchasing of healthcare equipment. So great, it's a great demo, and I hope people go see it. Doug, thanks for coming on theCUBE, really appreciate it. Got a break. This is theCUBE, we're live at the IBM Premier Cloud Conference, IBM Pulse. This is exclusive coverage from SiliconANGLE. It's theCUBE, we'll be right back after this short break.